what's so amazing about Rancho Pena Esquitos is um, it's really unique in the amount of open space you have to enjoy, which means there's so much more wildlife. And as Kate was saying, um, there's, a, there's a lot of interaction. So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. In the Rancho Penasquitos Canyon, this slide shows just the city of San Diego, open space in the Black Mountain and Los Penasquitos Ranger Districts. It really covers um, the city of San Diego bound northern and eastern boundary down to Miramar. Um, this does not include lands that are conserved by U.S. Fish and Wildlife or the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the county, or other agencies that have conserved lands. So there is a lot of conserved natural open space in Rancho Penasquitos. And that's not by accident. It's not by accident that we have this much open space. In the early 1990s, when Rancho Penasquitos was being planned, um, the community, everyone said, okay, we want to make sure because there's so much beautiful natural, Southern California natural habitat, we want to conserve as much as possible. So there was a goal, the overall goal in the community plan is as state, as follows to ensure a pleasant and healthful physical and social environment for residents by balancing development with the preservation of the community's natural resources and amenities. And that's really been successful. We can look at this chart. You can see that 30% of all of the land in the community of Rancho Penasquitos has been conserved as open space. That is so unique in the city of San Diego. And so with this, I'm telling you this because the community plan really dictates how we manage the open space. So within the community plan are certain policies. For instance, we are um, required to conserve, enhance and restore all of the open space in Rancho Penasquitos. Um, there is a goal to retain viable connected systems. So connecting Black Mountain to Los Penasquitos Canyon is important. McGonagall Canyon to Deer Canyon and, and actually trying to connect all of that to areas like Mission Trails. So keeping that open space connected so that um, we can, the wildlife actually can move through. The habitat is meant to be kept in its most natural state. So what is natural and native to Southern California? Now, all of this is also governed by one of our important documents, the Multiple Species Conservation Plan. That really does dictate, dictate everything we do in our open space. It's, it's the document that we use to manage all of these lands. And that really restricts what we can do. For instance, we cannot remove a naturally occurring species um, from the open space. Um, so like we can't just go out and indiscriminately clear vegetation because you know, it blocks my view or we can't go in and move, remove coyotes just because they become a nuisance because the multiple species conservation program is to conserve multiple species. What's really fantastic about San Diego is that we are the most biologically diverse county in the continental United States. The only state area that has more biological diversity is Hawaii. So we're that special as a county. And Rancho Penasquitos is an amazing example of that with all of the conserved lands that you're able to enjoy. So you have these beautiful views that you can enjoy and not just your community members, but also people from the entire region can come out and enjoy the Southern California native habitats like coastal sage scrub, the chaparral and the grasslands all of this beautiful natural landscape 
provides wonderful, healthy habitat for our animal species as well. In Penasquitos Canyon, in Rancho Penasquitos, we have at seven medium to large mammals in addition to the numerous smaller critters that call this area home. Our coyotes, the deer, the bobcat, um, the occasional mountain lion. So all uh, foxes, uh, raccoons, squirrels, skunks, all of those things live here because of the wonderful job that's been done in conserving the natural habitat. So with all of this though, um, comes that residential open space interface where the two meet. Um, many houses are built right up against that open space. Um, you'll have whole hillsides that are just lined with houses that look down over this beautiful open space. So we as humans have adapted <laughs> the natural lands well, coyotes and our other animal species have adapted to the urban environments into our neighborhoods. Now, just because that's happened, those interactions don't have to be negative. If we can follow certain guidelines, proper etiquette, then it will be safe. Remember, our, the goal of our community was to balance the natural and the the resident natural and the developed lands um, for, the, for the enjoyment of everyone. Well, that includes the wildlife. So what are those etiquette? What is those, those guidelines? What are, what's the etiquette for visiting, uh, for, for keeping this happening? So when you come to visit, uh, many of you probably are aware of or have visited Penasquitos Canyon Preserve before. Um, we also have Black Mountain open space. I mean, there's spectacular lands out here um, with tens of miles of trails among the two. Um, so when you come to visit, let's say you wanna come and visit Penasquitos Canyon Preserve. The number one thing you wanna do is get a map. How do you get a map? You can find this map, the one that's in the background here at sandiego.gov. And all you have to do is type in trail maps and you will be taken to a page where there are maps for every, all the open spaces in the city of San Diego, not necessarily the county, or, but for the city of San Diego Parks and Recreation Department. Um, so when you visit one of these open spaces, stay on the designated trails. That, what that does is provide a space for humans and a space for the animals. When you're visiting and you bring your pets, which your dogs are allowed, keep your dogs on a leash that is no more than six feet long. You're gonna hear this multiple times in this presentation because the, by having your pet farther away, perhaps on a retractable leash or, long, or without a leash, you are just providing an easy meal for our coyotes. Um, Another thing to remember when visiting these areas, they're day use only. Um, wild animals come out at dusk and dawn. So when the sun is setting, when the sun comes up, that's when they're most active. So we wanna give it back to them, let them feel free and safe to move about in their natural habitat without us. And then if we are privileged enough to see one of these wild animals while we, while we are visiting, we want to make sure to give the animal their personal space. Don't take selfies with wild animals. Um, don't, don't chase after them. This is their space. Uh, when we visit the, oh, the, um, the parks and preserves. Um, I want to go back to the designated trails. There are many um, electronic apps. There's apps we can get on our phones um, that are user generated maps and they don't always have the official designated permitted trails. Sometimes they encourage people to go into areas that are not approved. Um, and the reason why we have areas that are off limits to humans is because we need to give the animals an opportunity. So a good way to know if you don't have a map or maybe you're like, hmm, this looks odd. A good way to know whether or not you're on a designated trail is you'll see a sign. We work very hard to make sure that all of our trails are signed. 
So if you do not see one of these signs encouraging you to use the path, then it is likely not an official trail. What happens very often is a person will see a wildlife path or they will hear the creek thinking, aha, there's the waterfall and they'll follow it. And then another person sees the track and they go and another person and another person. So pretty soon we have all of these trails that aren't really official trails that can lead people into bad areas, <laughs> poison oak, laden, or where the wildlife like to be because they followed a wildlife path. So look for the trail signs. The reason why we're saying this is that there's a lot of people in our open spaces, especially now since COVID. This is where we can recreate is outside. We're encouraged to do that. Um, so there's so many people. We want to really provide a place where the animals can feel safe. Um, though they tend to be most active at sunset and sunrise, they'll come out in the daytime as well. Um, some things to remember with our with the COVID, we're, we're really seeing that our areas are being overloved. So what we'd like to take this opportunity to share with you is to please pick up your pet waste, pick up your trash. Please do not leave your own human waste in the parks and preserves. We're sadly seeing more of that. Also amplified music, and I don't just mean carried around your boom box, um, but you might want to enjoy some music while you're on the trail, but that doesn't mean everyone else does, nor do the animals need to hear um, our playlist. So either don't use music or use it only in a personal device on your ears, not with a Bluetooth speaker. Um, we're seeing a lot of that as well. Um, swimming is not permitted in the creeks. Um, and when you go off trail, you put yourself in a lot of danger to, um, encounter our poison oak and ticks and snakes and the wildlife that are just trying to live here. If we can maintain a healthy native environment for our coyotes and other wildlife, giving them this safe place to exist, we're going to reduce their desire to come into ours because there's plenty of food and plenty of land for them to enjoy in the native areas. And this is just one example. This is a fun wildlife camera we had in Penasquitos, you'll notice a rabbit. Coyotes enjoy eating rabbits. That's on their, that's um, on their accepted <laughs> food list. Now, this is just a fun. This same area, this is a doctored photo, but I just want to show this. The same area, a coyote appeared. Notice the timestamp. 24 seconds later, that coyote showed up. Now, I don't know if this was a successful hunt, um, if that rabbit made it, but... Uh, we do know for a fact that our coyotes are successful hunters. Um, and like I said, there's plenty of natural food sources for them in the conserved open space. But these animals are opportunistic. So they're gonna come looking for an easy meal. That means our yards, our space. So what can we do that will um, help that will make the coyotes and other animals feel like they're not welcome. We don't want to set out the welcome map for them. We want to discourage them from coming into our yards. So we can do things like do not feed them. Do not field, feed the wildlife. So in saying that, that means don't feed your pets outside. Don't leave your small pets outside. That's considered a meal for a coyote. Don't leave water sources outside. Don't provide areas for them to hide. So you wanna make sure that you trim that shrubbery up, secure your trash cans, because those trash cans, that's a good opportunity for food. Fruit trees, compost piles, those are all things that are gonna invite the coyotes into our yards. Additionally, if you feed, for instance, rabbits, or squirrels or birds, that's encouraging those animals to come into your yard. Guess what coyotes eat? Squirrels, rabbits, and birds. So actually by feeding those smaller, uh, what we think the cute and cuddly ones, we're actually then inviting the larger predators into our yards. You can put up motion sensitive lighting, motion sensor 
sensitive sprinklers. Um, and those of you that keep chickens or rabbits, you're gonna wanna make sure that those are in secure enclosures. Because again, that is an easy food source for the coyote. So let's say we do all these wonderful things and we've protected our yard. Now, what can we do if we run across a coyote? Maybe we come across one on the trail. Maybe we see one in our yard, in our driveway. We want to engage in coyote hazing. What is hazing? That is a process meant to scare wild animals away and make sure that it instills a fear of humans in them. We want them to look at humans as something to be afraid of and not to be near. We do not want to have them look at humans like, ooh, here's an opportunity to get an easy meal. Number one, best strategy to haze a coyote when you're out in the canyon or if you see one in your driveway, put your arms up, get as big as you can and yell, go away coyote, go away, and just keep yelling. Clap your hands, stomp your feet, use whistles. Um, Kate will talk about some more um, things that are very, very successful. The thing with hazing is you can't stop. You need to continue hazing until that, that animal runs away. Many wild animals will look at you when you're hazing them. They'll, maybe they'll start walking away slowly. They'll turn around and look back. You keep hazing them. You can even you know, walk toward them a little bit to really indicate that you are the dominant species and that you're something to be afraid of. This won't work if you're standing behind a tree or a bush yelling at them. Now they're gonna be afraid of trees and bushes. Um, so do that. Haze these animals so that they will really see that we're something to be afraid of. They won't want to be around us, nor will they want to be around our dogs, which are on leashes no more than six feet. Now, I do this. Let's say I do this. I'm really good. I don't, I don't have any bird feeders. I don't feed the squirrels. I, take, I bring my pets and my small children in all the time at night. So yes, my yard is coyote free, but my neighbor two doors down, they've got chickens and they've got lots of bird feeders and coyotes are always coming into their yard. So it's not gonna work if only one of us does it. We all need to be involved in this. So share this information with your friends, your family, your neighbors. Um, Humanesociety.org has wonderful information. You can just type into the, your search engine um, uh, about coyote hazing, tips on um, avoiding, you know, keeping wildlife out of your yard. So just, these are just really simple basic tips that are going to help us maintain that balance between the open space and the developed lands of our neighborhood. Now, coyotes are one of our animals that we are concerned about, but what about our slithery neighbors? Uh, Ranger Melanie is gonna discuss that with us now. So I am going to turn this over to her. Oh. I need to stop sharing. Almost there. <laughs> All right. Where is she? There Oh, you've spotlighted me. Okay. Um, and I think I need some some host action here or yeah. co-host. Oh, don't I have you? Get, didn't I make you co-host? Uh, I made you. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, let me see. Oh, oh, let's see. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, let's talk about snakes. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> oh, sound it's a familiar sound. So, while rattlesnakes might get the most press, um, there are actually a lot of other snakes. Uh, in San Diego County, there's around 30 different species. Um, in Los Pen, you can see these are our main ones that we have here. Uh, but None of these snake species are particularly aggressive. None of them are really territorial. Um, not the same way that other mammals might be. They, they fight with each other a lot. They'll, they'll mark their scents and stuff. Snakes don't really do any of that um, outside of a little bit of like mating dominant stuff. Um, and really most of these snakes are non-venomous. 
uh, or they're teeny tiny and they do not have venom that can be harmful to humans at all. Um, like one of those there is a southwestern thread snake. Uh, that is an adorable, teeniest, tiniest little snake that you would mistake for an earthworm. Um, they live underground, so most snakes are just not, they're really not an issue. My dog did find one of those one time uh, right outside my house back when I lived in Encanto. And uh, he found it by pooping on it in the street gutter. So these snakes, even the rare ones that you never expect to see, are in and around our homes. Um, and most of them are doing nothing that bothers any of us, um, including, dun dun dun, our rattlesnakes. So um, we have three species of rattlesnakes predominantly uh, in our part of the county. Uh, there's this one, the Southern Pacific rattlesnake. Um, and then we also have two others, the red diamond rattlesnake and the speckled rattlesnake. Um, there is a fourth species in San Diego County, but it's way out in East County. I don't even have it pictured here. Um, it's the Colorado Sidewinder, Colorado Desert Sidewinder, excuse me. Um, but kind of looking at these photos and I can surf back through the other ones, you can sort of see the identifying marks because that's what a lot of people want to know. Like, what is a rattlesnake? How do I know? Since these are the only venomous ones we have that can do damage to human tissues, what are the, what are the ID cues that we want to look for? Well, that rattle's a big one. Uh, all of them have that. They all have this kind of interesting splotching pattern. Uh, you'll see even this one has it, uh, kind of the diamond shape splotching on the back. And this one, the Southern Pacific too, has that similar diamond shape splotching on the back, the rattle. You'll see all of them have this very blocky kind of triangular head. Uh, some folks call it heart-shaped. Um, that is to make room in their skull for venom sacs. So, most of our other snakes do not have those kinds of patterns, markings, or trademark rattles. Um, you might have met this one. Uh, this is one of our most common snakes. You're arguably more common than rattlesnakes. Um, you'll meet them a ton out on the trail and in the preserves and probably in your backyard. Um, these are really peaceful giants. They're about the same size as rattlesnakes, about three to five feet. Um, they get to be the same sort of girth because uh, they're eating the same stuff. They're eating rodents, um, gopher snake, as the name kind of cues you in. Um, but you can see this is a very different snake. Uh, and unfortunately, these ones, while people are in a panic, uh, they, they don't recognize the difference here. Um, and here's some side by side. You can see up in that left corner, that's a red diamond. You see the rattle, the splotching, the coloration, the head. Um, next to it is the gopher snake. It, it's got a real, like, pretty stark checkerboard pattern, a uh, really smooth transition of head to neck and body. Um, and down below, you've got a mating pair of the Southern Pacific rattlesnakes. You can really see the differences. Um, that's right now, while we're at home, uh, looking at a screen, at least panicking. But out on, outdoors, and especially in our home, we're thinking, oh no, my fluffy little, little creature or my child is close to a snake. Folks panic. So why are we panicking? This is why. Um, rattlesnakes have a bad rap for their uh, venom. Like we're freaked out about that. And we've probably all seen um, some pictures of what it can do. It's, it's pretty, pretty gnarly stuff. What is venom though? Venom is primarily digestive enzymes. Um, it does have a hematoxic enzyme or a couple of them in there, um, and that's really what makes it so devastating to tissues, but it's doing largely the same thing that our human saliva does. Um, it's, it's starting that digestive process, which is really important for snakes because they don't chew, right? They swallow things whole. Um, that horned lizard, that squirrel, that's got to just digest and essentially dissolve entirely in the body of that snake. Um, snakes have a lot of the same organs we do. They're just kind of stretched out and in funny shapes and places comparatively. Um, but it needs to go from an entire animal to a smudge that it can pass out uh, its cloaca. So that's, it needs those enzymes. Um, and rattlesnakes, they're they're evolved with that hematoxic one that really attacks tissues. It attacks the blood cells, it changes coagulation rates, and really just rapidly breaks down that tissue. Um, 
to help with their swallowing, to help with their whole digestive process. Um, and so that kind of leads us to wonder, they're trying to eat rodents, things that are smaller than them, including other smaller snakes, lizards, stuff like that. Why do people get bitten? Why, they're not trying to eat us, very obviously. Um, well, it's because we don't really listen all that well. Let's see if we can get this to play for you. You can hear that rattle. You can see, yeah, what is he doing? That snake is giving all kinds of signals. She's trying to run away. She's using defensive posturing. Um, she's really trying to get out of there. And this guy keeps messing with her. And um, so you can see that really a lot of the issue here is us. Um, she's giving so many warning signs. She really tried to flee. Uh, and just as a fun fact, 70% of rattlesnake bites tend to be delivered to young men between the ages of 18 and 25, like our fellow here in the video, and often a strong subset of those involve alcohol. So they're trying to catch the snake. If you, if you don't mess with the snake, the snake won't mess with you. Um, because this is what they think of us. They're looking at a big animal. It's got eyes in the front of our head. That's predator, like biology 101. And snakes are not, including rattlesnakes, they're not immune to predators. Um, they get eaten by other snakes, especially king snakes. Bobcats will have a little feast there. Red-tailed hawks. Um, those two snakes in the corner are engaged in some territorial dominance displays. Uh, so they're, that's really their only nascent aggressive thing. Otherwise, they're really afraid of being eaten or they're trying to eat something. Um, and they're afraid of us. And there's good reason for them to be afraid of us. Uh, we really set the tone of the interaction. Um, because they're a prey species, that like only 20% of little rattlesnake babies make it to their first year. And then not all of them make it to their second. So um, our, our actions are involved in that too. We're actually changing the behavior of these species because we kill snakes that make that trademark sound so prejudicially. Um, there are some behavioral studies in snake in rattlesnake populations that show they're starting to stop rattle. That's not something, so a bobcat comes up there and hears that sound, bobcat goes away for the most part or waits until it can kind of stalk and find that snake in a different zone. Humans are the ones that keep going up and we hear that rattle and we're like, oh, pff, kill it. We don't listen to, to the signs and the, and the warnings. Um, but meanwhile, they're really, really ecologically important. So you can see they're a prey species. They, they feed all of these other animals. Um, but as well in those other, that previous slide, they're eating a lot of the teeny tiny things. They're eating a lot of the rodents, the lizards. Um, what do rodents do? Rodents have a tendency to spread disease. Um, they're, they tend to live in really close colonies, get really big populations. So rattlesnakes play a really huge role ecologically on both ends of the trophic scale. Um, and that affects us too. If you have, a, if you have unchecked populations of rodents, that's, that's what's going to be brought into your backyard, into your home. Um, if anyone's ever heard of the Hanta virus, that's, you know, it's, it's a concern and we want to live in balance with these other species, live harmoniously with our ecology that's around us. Um, so we really don't want to kill rattlesnakes because they're very, very important. Um, so how can we interact with these species in a way that isn't harmful? Um, so if you're out on the trail, if you're out in the preserve, stay on the trail. They primarily live off the trail. Um, they will get on the trail and you can see here's tracks of one that's on a trail right there. They'll get on there, but they're just on there to sun because they are cold blooded. They, they need sun, they need external heat sources to keep their metabolism going, especially if they've eaten, stuff like that. Um, so if you see one stretched out across the trail, you and your dog that are on their six foot leash, you've got that dog under control, you can stop it. You can stop yourself and you can give them space. Um, 
So don't put your hands or your feet anywhere that you can't see them. Don't reach into that, oh, I wonder what's in this bush. I wonder what's under this. Well, it could be a snake because that's their habitat. That's their home. Um, they're very shy, reclusive species. And they, so they're going to hide in those places because they're afraid of getting eaten for the most part. Um, but if you do meet one on the trail, it's all stretched out, ready to sun, or even if it's coiled up and defensive, um, just give it space, give it time, and it'll leave. It, they are very conflict avoiders, um, and they'll they'll take off if it's really cold out or if the snake's really cold. They're very sluggish, um, and they might not go quickly. If you can't, for whatever reason, if you can't go back to another trail intersection and just take another route, which in Penisquitos Canyon, there's generally a lot of other routes you can take um, without getting lost, especially if you're looking at your maps and stuff like that. It's we're in East West Canyon, we're on parallel with the creek. Um, so, okay, you can't go back. Well, then just stomp your feet, tap the ground with the stick, don't throw stuff at the snake, don't, don't tap the snake, don't get close to it. Um, but that's going to trigger it to just slither off. It's just going to go straight into the bushes to the side of the trail. Um, and, and further on and out. And so just give it space, give it time, and then you can continue on your way. Um, what do we do if they're at our homes? So, um, or how do we prevent them from getting into our homes in the first place? Um, again, at home, best practices, don't put your hands or feet where you can't see them because <laughs> snakes like to hide. Um, so that means the wood pile, that means the shed um, underneath your geraniums. Uh, you want to minimize their entrance ability into your yard so you can use snake and rodent barriers in your fencing. Uh, snake barrier, yeah, keep the snake out. Rodent barrier, keep, keep the snake's meal out. Um, do what you can to reduce coverage, uh, meaning like kind of skirt your bushes up a little bit or really make that wood pile very organized. Um, covered, contained even. Uh, reduce that coverage, reduce the food sources for the small animals like rabbits and birds that would then attract the rattlesnakes. Um, you just want to generally, as uh, Senior Ranger Gina was saying, reduce the incentives for them to come by because they're a wild animal. They're trying to survive. So they just want to have the easiest meal possible. Um, if you've heard the adage of like shooting fish in a barrel, yeah, something contained inside your walls, inside your yard becomes a lot easier to hunt than something that's roaming out free. Um, but if you reduce those incentives, you reduce the incidence of these beautiful creatures. They're really stunning. They're gorgeous um, coming into your yard. But so now, what if it does get there anyway? Well, first off, don't panic. Panic, don't panic, don't panic. Um, you want to send those who are panicking, including your children, your pets, and scared adults, indoors immediately. Um, the snake will actually leave if you give it the chance. So it might feel like it might give you the willies or something to just let it go, but it got in there and it'll get out of there. Um, if for whatever reason you, you need it cleared immediately or, or sooner than just whenever the snake chooses, um, you can call a local wildlife removal service. Uh, Tom's Snakes and Rattlesnake Rescue, uh, his number is there. Um, he comes recommended by the Humane Society, and we've also utilized his services uh, for, for neighbors and stuff um, in the canyon. So he's, uh, that's a reliable source. Um, if the rattlesnake is somehow inside your home and not just in the yard, go ahead and call Tom um, or improvise something safe. Uh, so this is where you would use some creativity. And as you can see in this example, you know, Push brooms are very handy. You kind of just shoo that snake away into a container that you can close. So whether it be a pillowcase, which might be tricky, or whether it be a large, like big um, garbage container or something like that, you don't want it to be a little teeny bucket or a little teeny bin because like, what are you, where are your hands going to go? Think about those kinds of things. Um, there's plenty of resources online you can look at. Um, but just, you know, if you use your brain, just stay away from the danger end and, uh, and use kind of long objects. Um, you should be able to handle it okay. But again, if you can just get, the, if the snake's just in your yard, it'll probably just leave. Um, the Humane Society has a lot of really good information written out on their website as well about what to do. Um, so just because we gotta, we gotta include this bit, um, should all things go awry and you end up bitten or your loved one is bitten, um, 
call 911 first and foremost, then draw a circle, um, get that Sharpie, some permanent marker, um, draw a circle around the bite and around the affected area. So any swelling, redness, um, edema, anything that's showing up, you wanna get it as soon to the bite as possible and write the time, like actually write it on your arm um, because that is going to be really valuable later. Uh, then go about your first aid as you would with any kind of open wound, wash it, at the sink, or if you're out on the trail, pull out your first aid kit, do what you can to wash and sterilize it. Cause even if it was a dry bite, so I didn't go over this, they, they don't always inject venom. Um, this, you could do that for any animal bite. You wanna clean it cause their teeth are just kind of dirty. Um, actually the dirtiest bite you can get is from a human. So if you get a human bite too, you go sterilize that thing. Um, but so just treat it like you would any open wound, um, but because this is a rattlesnake, very emphatically remove anything that is tight from the affected limb, whether it was on your hand, your foot, most common locations or somewhere else, remove tight stuff. Um, because of that hemotoxic effect in the venom, you start swelling. It, it messes with the coagulation. Um, you start getting edemas like big liquid pockets and, and stuff gets real puffy real fast. Um, so especially jewelry, anything like that, because say the necrotic tissue, it's in your finger, um, it's, it's eaten up in that way. With the antivenin, that could be reduced, that can go down, but your, your ring has turned into a tourniquet and things at the hospital can take some time. So just get that off, get anything tight off of the area before it's a problem. Um, if it's possible, get a photo of the snake that bit you. Uh, or your friend, um, because that when you share that with the medics and the doctors, that really helps them narrow in on what antivenin, what do you need. Um, while you're en route to the hospital, so that's the 911 dispatcher is gonna tell you where to go. Um, they're gonna tell you where's the nearest antivenin location for you. Um, while you're on your way there, either in the ambulance or in your own car or friend's car, or whatever, um, monitor the progress of that swelling and that red and that redness, that edema. If there is venom in there, it's going to show itself um, and it's going to be really, really painful. It's, it's breaking your tissue apart molecularly. Um, so you want to keep drawing larger and larger circles. Keep that permanent marker with you and keep drawing circles around the area. So as it expands out from the first circle you made, draw another one that captures it, put another timestamp on it. Um, this is really, really important. If you remember nothing else from the slide, remember to do that because that tells the medics, it tells the doctors um, what, what potentially that bite contained. Was it a wet bite? And did it like, what's the rate of change there? That lets them triage. It lets them figure it out just way better. So just keep that marker. If, if you're on a hike, I always have a permanent marker in my backpack, not only for rattlesnake stuff, but it'll go that way too. Um, just throw a Sharpie in your bags. Um, but on top of all of that, remain calm throughout the whole thing, which is gonna be hard because it's gonna hurt. Um, so lie down, immobilize the limb as best you can, keep it kind of below your, below your heart level. Um, try, you're really just trying to slow that circulation. So the calmer you are, the slower your blood is pumping, the, the less that venom is circulating further into your limb. Um, so that's, that's the big deal here. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now and uh, hand it back over to Kathleen or Gina. <laughs> I will take it. Thank you, Melanie. Mm -hmm. um, appreciate all that wonderful information about um, snakes and, um, and snake bites and how we can avoid them in our yards, which is what we're looking for, for sure. Um, what I wanted to share now is um, information about our mountain lions. Um, we get many calls, um, emails, next door accounts of, I saw a mountain lion on the trail, or I saw a mountain lion in my yard. Um, mountain lions can occur in um, our open spaces and in our neighborhoods. In fact, a couple of years, years ago, we did have one. But what we want to share is, just some some information again as melanie was talking about there's these wild animals that we have this great fear that you know they have this mystique around them and we and we really do fear them when we can in fact coexist we can live together um, 
fairly successfully. Um, mountain lions, again, like many of our creatures, um, they're not trying to be around us as humans. We are actually a predator to all of them. Um, mountain lions are very elusive. They're, so they're um, solitary creatures. In fact, the only times you're going to see more than one lion together, more than one lion at a time, is when they are, it's mating season, or if a female has cubs with her. Their territories can range 125 square miles. There might be some overlap in that, uh, but for the most part, those animals are by themselves. And they have, they, all of this work that we've done in conserving this natural, these natural areas, this natural habitat, making those wildlife connections is so that these animals can still move through. Mountain lion's main food source is deer. So wherever there are deer, there's a possibility of mountain lions moving through the area. Um, so we, just because we get a lot of, I think I saw a mountain lion, we're going to play a little game. I hope I can play a little. My screen is now deciding not to cooperate with me. There we go. Mountain lion or bobcat. So you can just kind of keep a mental note to, of what you think this one is, okay? So number one, mountain lion or bobcat. You're walking on the trail. You see this cat that's much larger than the one you have at home. Okay, now, um, I'm sorry, am I, I clicking the wrong thing here? Okay, mountain lion or bobcat? Again, just kind of looking at that. What's your guess? Um, number three, mountain lion or bobcat? And just so you know, all of these pictures are taken from areas right here in, Pen in, in San Diego, not all from Penasquitos, but some of them. Here's a tricky one, mountain lion or bobcat? And you get extra points if you can find the second one that's in the picture. You have to look closely. I'll give you a second. All right, number five, mountain lion or bobcat? And number six, mountain lion or bobcat. So how did you do? First two were bobcats. Third one, mountain lion. That fourth tricky one, mountain lion cub. And there were actually two. There was a little tail stuck behind it. Um, fifth one was a bobcat. Sixth one was a mountain lion. So here's how you tell the difference. Um, this is a really good <laughs> demonstration of the difference between a mountain lion and a bobcat. Mountain lions are one color. They are always this very tawny, um, this sort of reddishy tan color, solid, nose to tail. You'll notice the tail is extremely long. It is as probably as long as the entire body itself. Um, they are, you know, good seven to eight feet long tail, you know, nose to tip. Um, you'll notice that black tip on the tail. And then look at the ears. They're much more round. They're larger. This is a very large animal. So if on our trail, if you're out in on our trails, um, our, like our access road main trails, those are a good eight to 10 feet wide. The single track trails are about two to three feet wide. So if the cat that you're seeing walks across and is, you know, is about the same width as the two to three foot wide trail, that's a bobcat. Notice also our bobcats, they have stripes and spots on them. They can be gray, red. Um, they have all sorts of different kind of colors on them. And that tail, we often think that the bobcat has a super, super, super short tail. But the tails can be as long as a, as a dog's tail sometimes. They, they're not always just right up against the body. And then look at those ears. They're much smaller and they're pointy. So next time you're out and bobcats are much more common in our area. And like I said, there it's this the terrain of a mountain lion is much larger. So they just move through. They don't generally settle in one area, whereas bobcats will they'll stay in, in an area longer. So what do you do if you encounter a mountain lion? Uh, very important, 
Um, more important in the back country, but it can happen here in the city. I mean, it has happened. Keep your children close. This, this isn't just number, this doesn't matter mountain lions or not. When you're hiking in the, hiking anywhere, please keep your small children close to you. Um, again, mountain lions eat deer. They eat things that, um, and, and other animals that are smaller than them. So a small child is smaller than a mountain lion. So please keep them close to you. Don't hike alone. Do not approach a mountain lion. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're in these areas, we have trails, there's no fences, there's no barriers. Uh, we are entering the wildlife's home and they're welcome to go wherever they want. Um, and so if we stay on the designated trails, it's not that the animals don't come on those trails, it's that we can see them better uh, versus going through the, the grass where they're potentially hiding. Don't crouch or bend over when, if you see a mountain lion, that just looks like a, a prey response. Um, you wanna do, again, everything you can to be bigger, louder, and scarier than the mountain lion. So you get those arms up, you start waving them, you scream as loud as you can. You can actually move toward, not run, but just like you become the predator, you become the aggressor. You're not, you can throw sticks and rocks. Again, we're not trying to harm the animal, we're just trying to scare it away. If you are attacked, you fight back and you report that attack immediately. California, um, you, you have to, con you, we wanna report that, of course, you call 911. Um, you can contact the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, wildlife.ca.gov. Um, I think that, I thought, I, I think I have this in our presentation as well. So really, we're just trying to let the animal know we are something to be afraid of, right? We are the predator. We're the more dominant species in, in this area. So we let them know that. And the same principles apply to keeping mountain lions out of our yards as it does coyotes. Again, don't, don't let your pets out, you know. If our, our, our dogs are easy targets, especially when they're off leash or they're loose in our yards. Um, and any small animals is just an easy meal for these wild animals. Another thing we really would like to reiterate or, or to share with you this time of year, um, in the springtime, or, you know, early summer, we start getting, there's a lot of little baby animals that are rescued, quote unquote rescued. Um, because we think they've been abandoned. Well, wildlife, animals treat their babies differently than humans. Human babies, we are on them constantly, right? We give them every second of our attention. Well, animal babies are not the same. Their mothers will leave them for long periods of time. They could leave them for full days. Um, they're not abandoned generally. They're just waiting for mom to return because mom is hunting. Um, they might be crying, but that's just what babies do. Uh, so please leave them alone. In fact, mom might be waiting for you to leave the area to come back to rescue, to, to get her, collect her, her baby. Um, so in fact, our presence could be the thing that's preventing that baby from getting its food um, as, as necessary. So leave baby wildlife alone. Um, mom will probably be back. So we just wanna reiterate that again, these open space natural areas are here for the animals, the plants to survive. We have developed quite a lot of it and we want to give them some space. So by being good neighbors when we enter their space and being good neighbors by not inviting them into ours where there are additional dangers, then we can really all live together in that balanced environment, that balanced community where it's safe, not only for ourselves, but for the animals. We're so grateful for you having us with us, inviting us to talk with you tonight. Um, here's some information. I don't know if you could take a screenshot. I know um, Kate said that this is being recorded and could be viewed later. Um, any wildlife encounters can be can be reported to um, um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, it's kind of help for th helpful for them, but that's wildlife.ca.gov. They have really great resources on living with California wildlife. Uh, we use it a lot in our presentations. Um, if there is an emergency, please call 911. 
you can contact the park rangers. We don't work 24 hours a day, but um, we, we're happy to answer questions, um, to give you tips. Um, our phone numbers are there. You can also use the Get It Done app. I didn't put that on here. The Get It Done app with the City of San Diego or Ask Parks at San, using sandiego.gov. Um, so there's wonderful resources. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kate because she has some information. Kate, did you want me to share your presentation or are you going to share it? Uh, you, I, can you, pull it right I, I, I sent it to you. <laughs> Do you want to just, uh, can you run I it? I am going to try. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll start sharing again because then I can share screen. Um, boy, I'm having a bit of a time here. I'm going to close. I've got a lot of stuff open. <gasps> oh, oh I thought, I'm sorry. I gasped. I thought I closed my Zoom. Um, <laughs> I can't seem to get well, everything to close. With us here. Um, sorry, bear with me for a second. Okay. Are there any questions in the meantime uh, while Gina's getting the other presentation set up that we can answer? Either through the chat or um, directly if you unmute yourself. Yeah, I think, if, I think if you guys post some questions in the chat that have to do with the wildlife preserve and balance, that would be uh, the best way to start approaching that. Um, so here's, here we go. Um, I think. <laughs> can you see it? Kate? I can see it, but I, um, it's very little. Um, uh, Gina, you might be able to uh, make some options, like view options, uh, to get rid of the sort of next slide and the notes panel. Oh, that's being shown? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Boy, I apologize. I should give this to you, Melanie. <laughs> All right. No, no knowing what would have happened over the uh, Mac PC communication anyway. <laughs> okay. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Is it still being shown the next slide and everything? Uh, yeah. You're back in your kind of editing view. Okay. And now is it still editing view? Yeah. Uh, no, it's kind of that other one. Okay. There's the front one, but if I... I apologize for putting that on you. I didn't realize. No, it's okay. I, it... Here we go. How's that? Display the slideshow. There we go. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Okay. So thank you all for being here, number one. Uh, Rancho Penasquitas is home to all of us in springtime. While it's wonderful and lovely, it's also can be alarming because we're so used to living our busy lives and thinking we can just visit the wildlife area, but they decided to visit us in the spring. And I get calls, questions from my clients on a regular basis. What am I doing wrong? What do I need to do differently? How can I manage this safely? And, and they're concerned about their backyards, their fencing. And so we're going to talk about <clears throat> the first thing we're going to focus on is what can we do in our own yards to protect our perimeter and the interior space because the coyote can clear a fence. In, unless your fence is seven feet tall, you're, the coyote can clear your fence. So we have a false sense of security with our fencing. We've got a nice big fence. There's no holes in the fence. You know, it may be a chain link fence, but it's tall. So they're close together. Well, those, those are all opportunities for openings to come visit. And any time of the day, you know, we talked, we heard earlier that, you know, the coyotes are out and amongst us, and, you know, dawn and dusk. Well, they actually hunt 24 hours a day. And we'll hear our neighbors saying, I saw a coyote running down the street. Did you see the coyote jump the yard? It, in broad daylight, two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, the truth is they came out of the the easement bushes, because that's where they're living. <laughs> they live amongst us because we're in the middle of the open space, right? So they know where an easy, an easy meal is. They study us, they know our behaviors, they watch us. So here's a couple of fence options 
that have been the most effective. There's a lot of different things out there that you can do that, you know, I, you know, I hear a naysayer on, on everything I'm going to share with you tonight, but the top two, the top two deterrents to, it's not hazing, but it's, it's actual response time. So these coyote rollers that are sitting on top of um, this fence, it doesn't allow them to hook over. So this is actually, you can be put on the side right across the top. They can't, they can't climb over your fence. So they'll just spin. Most effective option other than, you know, replacing your fence with a seven foot fence. The next favorite option is the sprinkler light sensor that has got a high power spray. Coyotes do not like water. They don't like water. So when that light goes on and that spray goes right at the target, the, the sensor takes it, shoots it out there, it, it'll clear animals from your yard. So those, those two are my favorite deterrents for the perimeter of your yard. And now this is in addition to doing your due diligence, keeping, you know, keeping the water uh, supply and the food supply out of your backyard and don't leave your pets unattended. Now, these are all pretty small, but avoid, the bottom line is, avoid feeding the coyotes. When we have fountains going in our front yard, oh, there's a water source. When we let our kitty cats out and our dogs out, there's a food source. They watch our patterns. They, I, I watch the coyotes on our street watch us to see how, how we behave. You're looking at opportune moments. So all of this information is going to be available to every single one of you to really study, look it over, and see what you can do differently in your own life and then share it with your neighbor. Because as was mentioned earlier, a one it's not a one and done. We're here together. We need to raise the, the education element here and encourage our neighbors to partner with us to limit, you know, the flow effect, the down, the downward flow effect. Two doors down, they're not practicing, you know, cleanliness, maintenance. The rodents and the coyotes, they just they're gonna keep cruising the street. So um, so do do take a good look at this. Now I want to talk about your person and what you can do with your pet. I'm showing some items here that are highly recommended for those of us who walk our dogs at night, um, during the day. The, I'm going to start out with this high shrill coyote whistle. This makes the most piercing sound that will actually it'll drive a coyote away. If you're out walking your dog, you want this around your neck. Not in your hands, not in your pocket, but around your neck. So you spot the coyote, you give it its own warning. You take the, the um, alpha position. Also, when you're walking your dog, notice we've heard it a couple of times tonight. I'm going to emphasize this again. Your dog should never be more than six feet away from you. The loop lead with this short leash right here, six feet, keeps you looking like a unit. The coyote is not going to single out a dog. If you've got your dog on a retractable leash, 12 to 14 feet out in front of you, with a grip, the, the coyote sees prey, isolated prey that he can grab and snag and gone. And it happens quite often in Rancho Penasquitas every year we hear, my dog was captured by a coyote, he was ripped out of my hands. Well, they aren't geared up in a way for safety. This idea of walking our dogs in Rancho Penasquitas with an extended lead is a bad combination for safety for your pet. And those of us who have been tracked by coyotes and challenged by coyotes know that this, I can lift and pull any size dog to me in a nanosecond with a loop lead on my wrist. This one, I'm scrambling, trying to reel it in. This is, this is uh, 
This is not your friend. It sounds like a good idea. It's really a dangerous idea. For little dogs, actually these coyote vests, I'm gonna come down here to the bottom left. This coyote vest, there are multiple styles. This company is here in San Diego. You take your dog out on for walks. Should the unfortunate happen, this vest will not allow a coyote to grip, get a hold, it's the Kevlar vest. There are multiple prongs. It goes all the way up to around the neck. It can't grab and go. So again, it's a deterrent, but it's an effective deterrent. There's been over, I think it, you know, there's it's a four-year-old company at this point, and they've got over 2,000 stories of um, avoiding loss because of wearing this gear. The other thing I want to talk about is a light. If, you, if you're like many of us, we like to walk with our dogs at night. This light will deter a coyote. These, these lit um, collars, they, they do help. This is very, very important. It's not just for looks. It's not just so the dog can see where he's going. It's actually a clue that he's really not available. So this is a good idea. Safety tip. The other thing is I want to move to the non-escape harness. These non-escape harnesses that the dog steps into that click across the shoulders, nothing around the neck. Because a coyote can pull a dog out of a, a neck collar with amazing speed it, 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 and they're gone. So you want something again that the dog can't back out in fear, can't get out of it. Um, and the coyote can't pull them out of it. And if, you're, if you have this loop lead hooked to this, har this harness, you can lift immediately and protect your dog. So all of these items, I'm not recommending any one brand, but a high shrill um, whistle, a loop leash, six feet long, a coyote vest for the littles, a lit collar, and an escape proof harness are really the ideal gear and your best chances should you encounter a situation and it happens more often than not. Okay, so the next slide please. So it looks like we captured, we, we grabbed the same pictures. Um, for the rattlesnakes, they're out and about. I've seen a couple of them already in our neighborhoods. They're under the bushes like we've talked about. Uh, we just want to keep them out of our yard. So very effective, labor intensive. It's probably the most expensive thing you would invest in your uh, keeping your perimeter safe. But to bury the coyote, <clears throat> excuse me, the rattlesnake fencing that you see in the bottom picture um, keeps the rodents and rattlesnakes out. It's a great investment on any property. It's not really visible where those coyote rollers are visible. This rattlesnake fencing brings peace of mind like nothing else. So please take a look at, um, look at that option too, uh, around your fence, your, your gates, the, the base of your fence. All of these areas are, you know, open access. So we may think we're safe behind the fence, but we're coming under it. Next. Okay, so we talked, and so this, you know, we're duplicating things, but these, these three different wild, um, wildlife removal services will come out immediately. And this may be something you want to screenshot, take a picture of. It's going to be um, saved and replayed, but they're, they're all very responsive should you have a snake in your yard or a raccoon, uh, they will come take them back into their own world and their own space so you don't have to um, you have to mess with it. Okay, next one. Okay, so let's talk about should the unfortunate happen where your, your 
her baby is bitten on the nose. Um, more than 70% of rattlesnake bites are on the snout um, because dogs sniff and they do not know not to sniff. It's just in their nature. So these, while there are 14 different veterinary hospitals in our perimeter around us, uh, these are the, the facilities that offer both the rattlesnake vaccine, which is a three dose process and lasts about six months, plus the anti-venom. Now, all of these facilities use UCH um, Specialty Hospital and the Pali Emergency Clinic, who also carry the anti-venom. You wanna keep these numbers handy. Uh, time is of the essence if, you're, if your pet gets bit. Um, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to time. Again, it's kind of hard to use a marker, um, a Sharpie on a, you know, a fur baby, but you definitely want to get them to the closest facility. Um, the vaccine lasts six months. Thank you, Michelle, for asking. Uh, the vaccine usually lasts about six months, and it is given over a couple of month period. And it is, you know, in Rancho Penasquitas, I have quite a few um, clients that are actually have used the vaccine, but the vaccine is only buying you time and the recovery process if it's if they make it in time. It depends on where they're bit and how long you take before you get the anti-venom, but it, it does buy you that time and that insurance to, um, to make it to either one of any of these clinics or to the Pali Emergency Hospital, which is the closest. You're welcome, Michelle. Um, the VCH uh, Veterinary Hospital in Sereno Valley is the other referral service. Uh, all of these veterinary offices either use the recommend the Poway Emergency Hospital or um, the VCH on Sereno Valley Road. The Poway one is closer, so I highly recommend that you keep that phone number handy too. But again, if you call these, if you call the clinic to get in any of these clinics, um, these are definitely, um, they're gonna take good care of you and get you to the right source immediately. But as a pet, if you're a pet owner, and we have a lot of pet owners here in Rancho Penasquitas, you want, your dog will be better off with the vaccine. I'm not telling you what to do, but, um, with so many snake sightings already, and just given the nature of our fur babies, it's traumatic. It's traumatic to think that you might lose your loved one. Um, so it's better to um, have a plan. So the next slide, please. Okay, so the other thing with rattlesnakes and dogs is dogs, again, use those snout, they sniff, they sniff everything. They have to be taught not to, not to smell a snake. Well, not to smell anything, but definitely not to smell a snake. These two aversion training um, facilities are excellent and have group classes available. And it does work um, if you want to go that route. I mean, if you're an outdoor hiker, something that you're going to do on a regular basis, you, you definitely want to look into these two options. Okay, and that is that. I hope that you received some information here from living amongst the wildlife witness. Um, we in Rancho Penasquitas are here because we love the wildlife, but we're also here because we love our neighborhood. And it's pretty, it's pretty scary. Spring's a scary time. So we need these tools and these options to actually um, have a plan, create a plan. There was one other thing I wanted to share with, with everyone. You know, people, people have talked about, oh my gosh, the snakes have come in through the doggy door. Um, there, is a, there is a doggy door that works off of a fob and a fob connection on the collar that you can control with your phone from a distance. And it's actually just another layer of protection so that 
you control when your dog is going out and when, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out. I never advocate ha leaving your pets unattended outside. You think, well, we'll just let them out in the backyard. They need to be, with, they need, you know, to be watched. Just like you just wouldn't leave your little kid out in the backyard alone. You don't want to leave your dogs out there. Um, but the, the electronic doggy door is a pretty, pretty great tool for peace of mind. So, and it protects, you can control the raccoons coming in too. I mean, we've, the, the, the wildlife has, you know, they see an opportunity, you know, you may have the back door, here's the doggy door and here's a bowl of water and, a, and food, you know, for free feed. Um, you didn't leave it on the patio, right? But there it is. And their nose knows where to go. So we want, we want to just use as many tools as we can, as we can with information. Yeah. Um, and share it with our neighbors. Check out these items. See if it makes sense for your family. But share the, share the information with everyone. Um, I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to be looking. I guess it's right at the camera. So I just want to thank thank everyone here. If you have any additional questions, we have time, a little time for Q&A for, for any of us, but we want to support each and every neighborhood and each and every family to feel like they are supported with the information that they can use. You know, it's, and with that, the Rancho Penasquitas Town Council is here to bring good things to life. And cohabitating with our wildlife is is really an honor and scary <laughs> at times. So I'm gonna look at the chat. There's, it looks like there's some questions in the chat. Have, Gina, have you looked at these questions? Melanie, Melanie has been answering them as best she can. Okay, great. So, so okay. Um, so if there's any other questions, if you wanna know about other good things that you know, we have community seminars coming up on um, fire safety within the home, smoke alarm, smoke detectors, how much time you have. It's going to be a, it's called the two minute warning. And we'll be conducting that with the San Diego Red Cross and um, the fire department. Would love to have everyone participate with that as well. Um, we've got the pancake breakfast coming up, cooking with the council. We're all cooking together at home. It's a fun raiser or a fun raiser. So we'll be sharing recipes and tips from Rancho Pinasquitas. And everybody's invited. So check out our website and look at the upcoming um, Pinasquitas Pancake Kits. It's a porch pickup fundraiser and it's gonna be live streamed on April 10th. What else is going on? We have summer events coming up as well. So stay tuned. And, and Kate, if I can, um, so the Rangers were here. Um, part of our job is to be here for the community and share information. So if you ever have questions um, or anything, you can just look us up, sandiego.gov. I want to talk to a Ranger. Or you can just type in Los Penasquitos Canyon. Our phone number is in there. Um, please feel free to contact us, see us on the trail, stop us. Um, we love to share information because the more um, educated people are about the, the beauty of the place that we live and how we can all live together, the better it is for all of us. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't know about the rest of us that are still on the call, but it is an honor and a privilege to have such amazing rangers that make us feel like family and welcome into the preserve and really are, you know, Great stewards, great stewards of our thank you, unique, Kate. unique place on the planet. So thank you very much, Ranger thank Melanie, you. Ranger Gina, and all of you participants. Thank you for making time tonight. I know you could have done a lot of other things, but I hope you got value out of it. And please leave comments on our Facebook page. Um, your feedback is invaluable. Please accept the survey that's coming your way um, regarding the seminar and we want your feedback. What can we do differently? What else do you want to know about? Was, were these tips and informational 
clips, did they did they help you? Because we're here to serve and to keep the conversation going and to know better is to do better. So with, with that, hit us up on rpcouncil.com, Instagram, Rancho Penasquitas Town, and let's just let's just keep the conversation going. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks. Thanks, Molly. Sure, thank you. Bye, Molly.